Hello. <laughs> it's the Packs What She Said live recap episode after the Packers won at home against the Cleveland Browns 24-22. They are 12-3, and hold the best record in the NFC, hold the key to the one seed if they so desire it. Um, things are looking pretty good, but there's definitely a mixed bag to talk about today because this was a weird – a little bit of a weird game. Um, before we get into any of that, Maggie, how are you? I'm good. I'm getting my voice back from Saturday. It was a loud one. Lambo is rocking, which it was fun, but you know, I, a little raspy still. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> For everybody um, who doesn't know who's it, tuning in, Maggie and her husband Mark um, and some other family members were at the game on Christmas. So why don't you brag a little bit and tell the folks what it was like? Yeah, I mean, I've never obviously been to a Christmas game. It's not something that happens very frequently, but it was fun. Like, you know, Lambo, we played uh, Count the Grinches and the Santa Claus. There were there were quite a few. Um, there was a really drunk Santa Claus in our section, actually, that tried to start some fights with Browns fans. But, you know, we don't have to talk about that. Browns fans are great. We, I had three in front of me, and they kept turning around and high-fiving Mark, and then they would get mad when I would not high-five them anytime the Browns did something good. But they're just a really fun fan base to, like, interact with on Christmas very different than like Vikings fans good that's great <laughs> that's so fun for you guys also being a split household to have that and you got to witness history I did I got a little misty when they uh when it happened and then the whole crowd right when it happened started chanting MVP and it was just so special and then the Brett Favre tribute like I've yeah. I don't think I've ever heard Lambo that loud when he said uh, go get another Super Bowl yeah you could hear it through the TV um, it was wild. And then like all the videos, you could just tell, I mean, what a moment, right? Like that is, that's literally history, right? Like now Aaron Rodgers holds the touchdown record, um, for the entire franchise. Um, unbelievable. 443 ended up being 445 by the end of the game, right? Three for three. Um, crazy, crazy stuff. I, yeah. I'm so jealous. <laughs> well, and then Devonte obviously, you know, set his records mm. with Rogers catching two touchdowns to go up for the most prolific duo with 67 touchdowns. So, I mean, I guess we can kind of jump into that because after that first half, we were all like, okay, you know, it's going to be like 48 to 20, you know, like it just felt like the offense was on such a tear. It was such a historic kind of feeling it was Christmas the offense was rolling and the second half hit and we're like what the hell <laughs> you know, like it was yeah. just a complete 180 um between halves it was really strange it was um yeah I think it's easy to take away from this game and say like the defense let Nick Chubb run all over them and like yes that is true but I don't think this game was close or ever really in jeopardy if the Packers offense scores more than three points in the second half um, I just really didn't understand game plans working, stick with it. Um, and I am a run the ball. I'm in the run the ball camp, but I think when you are having as much success throwing the ball as Aaron Rodgers was in the first half, I mean, Denzel Ward could barely stop Devonte Adams. The rest of that secondary couldn't stop any of the other pass catchers. You saw that insane one handed catch by Alan Lazard. Um, why not just keep doing what was working? I mean, Devontae was barely targeted in the second half until that last drive where he had two very uncharacteristic drops. Um, it just was confusing to me. I haven't listened to Matt Lothar's press conference yet. I wonder if anyone asked him about it, but um, just sling the ball. Sling the ball around when it's working that well. Yeah, I mean, I think it was something like nine receptions in the first half for Devontae, and then he ended with 10, So, or he had like eight receptions and then 10 receptions total. So it was just a complete contrast, you know, going into it. And then to mirror that, I, I mean, the Browns ended with, God, it felt like almost 500 yards. They had 219 yards on the ground. Yeah, Everything was working for them. The end arounds with Anthony Schwartz, who is a track star, you know, so that would get them off base. And then Nick Chubb would pound it or Dearness Johnson. So they just, I mean, it was a really dangerous ground game. And you knew, you knew that was yeah. you know, kind of the formula. So, you know, as much as, you know, they, the game was kind of sealed on a Baker pick, I, I, we all in the stands kind of just felt like they were going to just methodically work their way down the field with the running backs. But unfortunately, Nick Chubb got so gassed for them that he had to take himself out of the game because he had like put the team on his back at that point yeah. and just couldn't keep it up. 
Yeah, I mean, that's been my, I think what we've been saying this week and with the Ravens last week is like just gap integrity, like just make it more difficult. And it, there was not, I mean, there was none of that. And I think on top of that, my biggest takeaway, honestly, from the rewatch, because, you know, you're not paying attention to as much and I can't like pause and rewind while I'm watching live. Like my biggest takeaway was like, yes, run game, run defense, not great. Nick Chubb, we said this, we just talked about this pre-show. He's like a one out of one kind of running back. The Packers are not going to see a guy like him unless they play Jonathan Taylor in the Super Bowl. Like there is just not another back like him. So, but 219 yards for anybody is like completely, it just should be unacceptable to them. Like they don't want to have to give that up. Um, the coverage is, the coverages were the same that they always were. They kept everything in front of them. They didn't really give up any big plays. Obviously, Baker had a bad game. Um, I think actually that the Packers front did a really nice job of pressuring him when he dropped back to pass. And two of his four picks actually came from pressure from Gary and Kenny. So like the front did what they were supposed to do. Like, And this Browns offense, obviously, I think just can't really lean on Baker um, when they need to. But coverages were soft, but like not any different than they have been the last couple of weeks. Honestly, I think if the Packers can tackle better, like took better angles and just tackle better, this game might not have been as close as it was. It was just like a really poor tackling day. And it sounds really simple, but, and we can make arguments and I'm sure we will go back and forth about like the coverages and everything, but that was my biggest takeaway. Just tackle better. Yeah, there were, there were, you know, kind of wide open running lanes and bad angles. And, you know, it was evident, like there were, there was just not, we talked about it last week too against the Ravens, the gap integrity wasn't there. And yes, Baker's not as mobile, especially with an injured shoulder. He wasn't leaning into his throws like he normally maybe would have been. But because of that, I think you have to lean into the run even more. And I thought it was kind of interesting on the last um, drive when I was just looking at the personnel, you know, Vernon Scott was out there and Henry Black. So it was just kind of a weird group yeah. to have out there unless, you know, you're thinking like heavy dime, you know, you force him to throw the ball. But a light box is not going to work against Nick Chubb either. Right. Like if if what the Browns were doing well was running the ball, we knew we knew that we knew they should lean on that going into this game. So like why the light boxes and maybe it's a personnel issue like but I mean, keep Kenny in there, put in TJ Slayton, like use your big bodies. You have divided <laughs> have Chris Barnes. <laughs> Hi, Bojack. Um, I just yeah, there were definitely some situations where I was like, oh, my God, just bring him down. Um so I'm curious to see, I mean, Dalvin Cook can get activated day of um, on Sunday for the game. I'm not sure, uh, you know, he obviously has to clear pro protocol, but I mean, I just, I'm curious to see how they do against Dalvin Cook because no, he's not Nick Chubb, but he's still, you know, a tier one running back that the Packers are going to need to stop. And they couldn't when they played them last time. Yeah. And the thing about the Vikings too, that poses, you know, a different challenge is you've got Justin Jefferson and the Browns right. don't have that kind of wide receiver one with, I mean, Jarvis Landry's good. DPJ is good, but mm -hmm. it's not, it's not the same. Justin Jefferson isn't like a league of his own with maybe Tay and a couple others in the NFL. So yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I mean, if cook can't play Madison's also been doing a really good job for them as, you know, kind of running back one B. <laughs> so there's just a lot of things to fix before you see, like a Kyler Murray offense or a Rams offense in the postseason. Yeah. So I want to talk about, I do want to talk about the secondary a bit because I think you and I had like a brief back and forth about it, but now we obviously have the space to like really talk about it. And it is the way that they're playing. And I had a really interesting discussion today. If you don't listen to, if you don't follow Packer report, um, you should be because they have great content. And I do a weekly recap episode with Ross Uglum, their editor. And we were talking today about, Joe Barry's coverages. And I, like I said, they're playing the same as they have been all season. So maybe it's just execution, right? That wasn't exactly there. And I asked him, I said the same question I asked you the other day, which was, you know, would we like to see now that Rasul Douglas and Stokes have kind of proven their abilities? Like, do we want to see them press a little bit more? Do we want to see a bit more man to man? Because Rasul Douglas even said after the game, like all of our picks came in man coverage, which I think is really interesting. And Ross made an interesting argument that some of the off 
um, off coverage, it allows guys like Rasul Douglas who watch film to jump routes, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's when those happen. So it should be a nice mix. Um, I'm curious your thoughts because I think it's also, you know, you add in the idea that like potentially Jair Alexander comes back and does that change, you know, the percentage of time where they're able to press a little bit more and be more aggressive. Yeah. I mean, I think it definitely is a combination and I'm sure you saw, you know, the Russell Douglas quote, but he was talking about um, the way that he watches film and I have to pull it up to make sure I get it right. Cause it was, okay. it was fantastic. I put it on Twitter today. He said, um, he was talking about his film study and he said, I try and look for plays that maybe I can get an interception on and I can jump. And I always tell my safeties what plays I'm going to jump. So in case it's not that hopefully they're in the post, if not, hopefully Jesus is in the post <laughs> to save me because he knows obviously at that point, he doesn't have any help behind him. So it's just really smart play from the corners. And I think Eric Stokes, if you watch his game, I thought he had some rookie growing pains, you know, in this game, but he also made some really nice, he has recovery speed. It's the same with Jair that, Guys yeah. like, you know what, Kevin King don't necessarily have. He had that really nice breakup in the middle of the field. I thought, you know, he caught up nicely to DPJ on a couple really deep balls. So the combination yeah. of Rasul being really aggressive and Stokes being sticky and able to recover quickly if he isn't in the right position is really dangerous, I think. Yeah, I mean, Stokes obviously broke up the two-point conversion, which ended up being game you know, like ha the game was on the line with, with that um, since they won by two. And then you look at, you know, he should have had another pick. I think it should have been five. He'd let one drop. And you, you like to see those happen. Honestly, I'm in the camper. I'll take a pass breakup any day. Like, it, that's fine. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm definitely curious to see what they do with Jair um, if and when he returns. Because I think it just adds a little bit more to what, Joe Barry can ask of them. Um, but regardless, like I think the, the Russell Douglas quote is really indicative of just the trust that they all have in each other and their communication. Now I did think that there were a couple of miscommunications for sure. Mm -hmm. And I, we saw those happen, especially in the red zone. And obviously red zone is still a major problem for this Packers defense that they're going to have to shore up before the postseason, um, especially if they're going to play this very, very bend, bend, bend defense where they're allowed a, allowing yards um, on the ground. So I just think like this is going to just be a game where they take the film back and hopefully make some adjustments. Now, there is also this trend that we can touch on since the bye week where they just haven't been I don't know what, what the word it would be. I think like tight is the word that comes to mind. Just they haven't been the unit that we saw that shut out the Seahawks, right? For example, they just haven't been that. And it's not that they've been going up against really good teams. Like they have all their good teams behind them, right? This is a team that kept Patrick Mahomes to 13 points and gate let the bears score 30. Um, so it's, it's the trend that I, is the thing that I'm concerned the most about. Yeah. And you know, you're, you're kind of running out of weeks to say, these are things you have to correct before you get into the postseason. You've got two games left at this point. And it's always, it always feels like when one unit plays really consistently, the other unit is missing, even if it's just quarter by quarter, there's not consistently across all fronts. And, you know, special teams was like, you know, they got a gold star because nothing bad happened. They made a field goal. Field position was good all game. And, you know, the offense gets the gold star the first half. Thanks to three picks in the first half by the defense yeah. offense is able to capitalize on all of those. And then the first, the second half, the, the wheels come off. So, you know, I think part of that is third down efficiency. Matt LaFleur talked about it a little bit post game, just they converted 30%. They were three for 10 and yeah. those things just can't happen. And, you know, in the, in the first half, again, when you're moving the ball, you're not really getting into too many third down situations, period. The second half, those are drive killers and that's how yeah. you let teams, especially like the Browns that are a run first team, get back into a football game. Absolutely. I completely agree. I mean, there were just, there were like, I mean, you said it right. The first half you don't see, they don't have many third downs period. Right. And obviously that's ideal, um, but that's also not realistic and you have to be able to convert. And I mean, credit where credit is due, right? Like the Browns defense played 
an amazing second half and they came out and like they have playmakers on that defense. We've been talking about it all season. Like Denzel Ward is no slouch. Um, mm-hmm. He obviously made his own adjustments covering Devontae Adams and that front can get after you now. Packers O-line. <laughs> I mean, Miles Garrett didn't touch Aaron Rodgers, and I know that he has a groin injury, la di da di da but come on. Even groin injury Miles Garrett going up against Yash Nyman pregame, what do you say, right? Like, you expect that Garrett gets at least a sack in there, right? And this is not even, like, we're at third string left tackle, second string everybody else. They only have one starter in right now, and it's Royce Newman, who's a rookie. It's just what they're doing is incredible. Um, you also obviously take a look at the fact that Aaron Rodgers was finally getting the ball out quickly, not mm-hmm. holding it. So also going to call out something that we've been clamoring for all season that he finally did. No complaints there. Um yeah, I just – this offense is so capable of putting up 35 every game. Um, and obviously, it's not going to happen. The other team pays their defenders. But when you see a second half that consists of a field goal, it's just – it's not good enough. Yeah, I mean, that field goal came with like nine minutes left in the third. So that's 24 minutes Yeah, that you're going without – you know, putting up points. I think they only had one first down and three consecutive drives at that point or after that. So it's like, you know, something's got to give. And we talked about, you know, the the dynamic of getting MVS back. I thought Alan Lazard had a really nice game. It looked like he dropped the touchdown in the end zone. Um, I definitely thought that that was a catchable ball, but MVS just, you know, he adds another wrinkle and we've talked about it as much as EQ and Alan Lazard and I thought Jawan Winfrey also was a catch that they challenged that, you know, they didn't overturn. But for as many as those guys can make plays, MBS just, you know, he takes the top off defenses. And I think when he's out, the offense becomes a little bit more one-dimensional almost. And not that you want that or expect that from a Matt LaFleur offense that is so creative, but it does change the way that teams are able to approach guys like Devontae Adams. It's true. It is true. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I think that the Packers – offense maybe was just like okay we're up two scores now let's just milk the clock and I would like to see them continue to put the dagger in I mean the perfect example right was the Bengals against the Ravens this week like just don't let up until the clock hits zero anything can happen they could have a punt return for a kickoff and that or for a touchdown and then all of a sudden you know you're back in it like anything can happen and I just would like to see the aggression holds strong um, all the way through. And I don't know. It sounds like Matt LaFleur, like that he preaches that that's the way he wants to coach. And sometimes it doesn't always translate. Yeah. And Devontae had said that, you know, like he said, thankfully the offense was hot in the first half and they were either the kind of able to kind of weather that storm. You know, it was one of those like, thanks past me for doing something the present me you know, <laughs> should have been doing, but they did say that, you know, like the, the foot came off the gas and those are things that they have to look at and figure out why that's consistently happening, at least the last couple of weeks. And we talked about it a little bit pre-show where, you know, you're, you're talking about the defense was doing so well, pitching shutouts or keeping really explosive offenses really limited when the offense wasn't able to put up a ton of points. And now we're almost at the flip side of this where the defense yeah. is breaking a little bit more than you'd like to see. But it's okay because the offense is able to put up as many points as they have been. So to get a game like this where you're you're still just not firing on all phases this close to the postseason, yeah, it's a letdown. Yeah, I mean, you want to be getting hot at the right time. And this was not a hot game. The piss was lukewarm. <laughs> um, I, oh, I was going to say something else. Now it's on my mind. It's fine. What other takeaways do you have from this game? Because I know you just did your rewatch. Um, I don't know. I I think I agree with you though, that like the defense holistically did play pretty well in the second half. It was frustrating, but I mean, the Browns were very methodical. They were burning a lot of time off the clock. So it felt like the offense was just really slow to find a rhythm, you know, like they, maybe they just got too cold, if that makes sense, um, where you're, you're sitting out and you're just kind of waiting. And I think that there were a lot of missed opportunities on both sides of the ball, uncharacteristic drops from Devante, just things that don't normally happen. And, You know, we talked about that after the Saints game, like, and you can't bank on that. You can't bank on your team having four turnovers, which now the Packers have the best turnover differential in the NFL, but four turnovers and five sacks, regardless of how you play, I think in any other phase, 
should win you a football game. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of little things. It feels like that if they just, you know, clean, clean up the ugly stuff that is uncharacteristic of the team this season, it'll go a long way. Felt like a 2019 game a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I mean, also like if you think about it, it's not like the Packers offense helped the defense at all from like an, like a time perspective either. Right. Like they didn't eat up the clock there. The Browns are driving really long drives. Defense is gassed. And then the offense goes three and out. Like that's not helping. That's not helping out your guys at all. Um, So, yeah, it's like I say this all the time and I mean it wholeheartedly, like you should not rely on interceptions to win games. I think that is like a poor tactic because they're so they're so variant and you're going to get to the postseason and you're going to get to guys like Tom Brady and Dak Prescott. And I'm not going to include Matthew Stafford and, (laughs) you know, but but quarterbacks that are more like Aaron Rodgers who don't turn the ball over as much. And again, you can't bank on it. Now, yes, you can make the argument Tom Brady had three interceptions at the NFC Championship game. Doesn't matter. They still lost that game. You know, like it's it's not going sure that end of game Rasul Douglas pick, that's the time. It's it's opportunistic. Um, but I just would not want to see them bank on that. That's why I like watching pass breakups. It's why I like when I see the Packers get off the field on third down. I think sacks are a little bit more of something you can and should rely upon. And I think Gary Preston and Kenny Clark right now are hot. Um, and they're watching Rashawn Gary pursue a quarterback and like have that pocket close in on it. It's, it brings me joy. Um, so I want to see that a little bit more. I mean, Dean Lowry getting a sack, love it. Um, that's what I want. I want high, I want pressure. I want lots of pressure. Yeah, I'm with you. And, you know, Kirk Cousins, obviously not a very stout O-line. You've got the Lions to close out the season. So two NFC North matchups, Packers still in control of their own destiny. Um, Cowboys looked like world beaters last night, but it's just hard to tell if that's football team. Right. It's if it's the level of competition or, you know, just the motivation that they have. But a lot of we talked about this last week, a lot of really good matchups still um, to kind of help decide how things shake out. (laughs) Cardinals Cowboys is a huge one. Um, Rams Ravens is a big one. Packers obviously hosting the Vikings on Sunday night football. It's supposed to be like 10 degrees. It's going to be awful out, um, especially at at night when there's no sunlight. So a lot of things could shake out in the next couple of weeks, depending on, you know, who, I guess who you're rooting for to make those wildcard spots. Yeah. I mean, Packers, obviously they control their own destiny. All they need to do is win out, right? Like don't get complacent put these to bed. Don't even make it a competition, right? Like go into the postseason. I just think there's a lot with the game that is mental. And there was a lot of conversations this week about like stats and DVOA and all these like lines and everything. And I I just always think that there's so much more to winning football games than numbers will show you. And to me, like the mental side of things is huge. Like if you're riding a hot wave, like the chiefs are right now, right? Like heading into the postseason, and you strike fear into the hearts of opposing teams and you're at home, you're at Lambeau, it's 10 degrees, it's snowing and you're the best team in the NFC right now. Like that mentality, that's important. Like you saw what happened this week with Justin Jefferson when he said like the locker room, the energy was just bad. Like you just felt it going into this game. It just wasn't good. Like that is something. And it doesn't matter. I mean, the Vikings game certainly matters and ending the season with the Lions, like you can kind of scoff at it. And it's something the Packers have done every season for like five years, I think at this point, but like, sorry, Lions, like put them away, you know, like do what the, what the Cowboys just did to the Washington football team pound it out. Like there, I think just think that there's something to be said for that, like mentally. Yeah. And the lions aren't going to roll over. I mean, we've seen them beat the Cardinals. They've beat good football teams. Dan Campbell's not going to be like, well, you know, we're, a we're out. Not, yeah, yeah. We're rather play for the, the number one draft pick. Like, you know, these are players that have a lot of pride and I, I do agree with you that, you know, playing at Lambo, the Packers are the only undefeated team at home this season. And, you know, Arrowhead's a tough place to play. Dallas is pretty good at home this season, but it's a stark contrast when they're on the road. So you need yeah. or you want, like you said, you want it to be 10 degrees and snowing. You want it to be at Lambeau Field. You want to feel like it's your house. And, 
it's unfortunate that last season, the NFC championship game was like 30 degrees and a sunny, beautiful day because the way that the playoff picture is shaping up, you've got LA teams and Arizona teams and Florida teams and Texas teams that could potentially be coming to Lambeau. And that, that should be enough to excite the team to, to really contend and put their yeah. best foot forward for the number one seed. I agree. I agree. Um, so this was fun. It was fun. Um, thank you all for joining us. Didn't see any comments, but I know you're out there. Um, <laughs> we'll be back with our regularly scheduled episode this week. We are having um, a really fun guest. Um, it's our first. No, I shouldn't say that because Peter Bukowski came on our second male guest of the season, a rare sighting. Um, we're going to have Eric Eager on from PFF. So we're going to get some good analytics talks in there uh, <laughs> for the Vikings game. Um, so check that one out. As always, you know that we are sponsored by Manscaped. Give the gift of Manscaped this holiday season slash this new year if you miss the holiday season. Um, thank you all. And uh, yeah, 12 and 3. Let's get it. Go Pack Go. Let's get it. Go Pack Go.